breaking news. AI video will put me and Anderson Cooper and Kiss all out of business. Nikon fights back against the new Sony A9 Mark III and the A1 with a mind-blowing, seriously, a mind-blowing firmware update for the Z8 and Z9 coming soon. Don't worry, Sony shooters. Sony announced a new firmware update coming soon, too. I'll get to all that and more, but first I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is your presence on the web, the presence that you completely control. This is so much better than social media because you control the branding. You don't put up your most recent images. You put up your best images. You're real. Squarespace is you selling your services, not social media selling advertising. Get started at squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out completely free, and I promise you will love it. When you do, the coupon code Tony will get you 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. Our first story is generative AI video. It's starting to become real. We'll look at a couple of companies and a couple of real-world implementations. First up is a company called Pika has gotten just a ton of money thrown at them because they've demonstrated the ability to do generative AI. This is like mid-journey is to still images, except you could actually generate video by just giving the artificial intelligence a few prompting words and letting it make something up. Those examples look pretty compelling and I have signed up for the beta, but I don't totally believe it until I can test it myself. Why? Because those examples are certainly cherry picked. They could even be completely faked be sure to subscribe and I will test these when a real public beta is available. Another similar company doing generative AI is Stable Diffusion. They've been known for sort of AI generated images that you can host on your own computer. It's based on open source. So you can customize it or build your own. Well, now they're moving into video and it's kind of scary. Again, the examples are limited, probably cherry picked, but we'll be checking this out soon. And regardless of where it is today, I'm sure in the very near future, AI generated video is going to be a real big thing. And we're looking at it because we're photographers, we're videographers, and so are you. And we care about all of our collective futures. There's also a move towards avatars, which are real people generated in AI. And I think this is going to happen a lot sooner than generative AI video, where something is generated from scratch. Because right now, you could scan yourself or even just scan videos of people that have already existed and then use that to train AI to make new stills and new video. And this is kind of appealing to me. I'll, I'll tell you about that. But first, let's look at a couple of examples. Anderson Cooper on CNN showed a two camera clip of himself. The catch is one of those cameras is totally AI generated, trained just on videos of him and the sound of his voice. And when I watched it, I didn't first realize this. Now, once you're looking for it, you might realize, oh, okay, they've made the wide camera AI because maybe the details aren't that crisp, or maybe you could spot some flaw. But if you weren't looking for it, I don't think any of us would notice. As a fellow newscaster, I can appreciate the idea of not having to um, brush my hair or put on a suit jacket to look official. It would be nice to just type a few prompts into my computer and have it generate me on a beautiful studio. Hell, at that point, me and Anderson can both stop dyeing our hair white. KISS also announced the beginning of a new era, an AI-generated era. They performed a concert and scanned themselves, all of their movements, and now AI will be able to crunch that and make whole new versions of themselves. Whoever rubbed a lamp and wished that Gene Simmons would live forever, I guess you got your wish, but I kind of wish you'd consulted the rest of us. AI video is going through the Gartner hype cycle shown here. In the lower left corner, you see the technology trigger, which was the development of large scale machine learning models. And right now we're, we're approaching the peak of inflated expectations. See, as we climb this peak, we're going to see companies like Pika, who can raise a whole bunch of money from the excitement around it, promoting themselves and the idea of it. And that cycle of hype 
and investor money will continue to build the peak for a little bit longer until we actually start to expect to see some of that stuff happen in the real world. And when they actually deliver it, we'll all be like, well, that's not nearly as good as I thought. And some of those companies will go out of business, but a few of them will survive to actually try to meet our expectations and make something practical now that all the investor money has run out. And that will be the trough of disillusionment. And then when they actually start to make something that can be productive, we'll start to climb the slope of enlightenment to the plateau of productivity where generative AI video, AI avatars will be commonplace. And then I won't have to iron a shirt anymore. I'll just generate Tony to tell you the news. Now let's talk about the Nikon Z9 and Z8 upcoming firmware update. But first I want to recap version 4.1 of the Z9 firmware because I never got to make a video about it. Nikon has been so amazing at releasing free firmware updates for the Z9. And when the Z9 first launched, we didn't love the camera. It had some huge problems with autofocus where it drastically underperformed cameras from Sony and Canon. But since then, Nikon has been working on it. And just this morning, I was out shooting wildlife with the Nikon Z9 and version 4.1. I was shooting side by side with the Sony A9 Mark III and the Sony A1. They were all excellent. The Z9 kept pace. It is able to distinguish flying birds across a complex background, faraway birds, close-up birds. It can spot the eye. And I really think of the three cameras, the one that does wildlife video the best is the Nikon Z9, not just because it has 8K at 60 frames per second, which the other cameras from Sony cannot match, but because I think the autofocus actually works better. To top it off, Nikon finally sent me my 600 millimeter F4 and it has the built-in teleconverter and real world wildlife photography. That is a huge advantage. The ability to just zoom into 840 millimeters without taking the lens off and fumbling to get a teleconverter means that I can switch between a wider angle of view and more detail in real time as a bird is approaching, as something pops up in the foreground that I want to capture. I'm thinking about switching to Nikon. I have a couple more tests I want to do, but it might be this month that you see a video from me titled Switching to Nikon. Even more exciting is an upcoming firmware update that should make the Z9 even better than the A1 or even the A9 Mark III in some ways. And these rumors come to us from NikonRumors.com. They say this firmware update is going to be coming this month in December. The first is that the Nikon Z9 and Z8 will be bumped to 30 frames per second at a full 45 megapixel RAW. Today, you can shoot RAW files at full 45 megapixels at 20 frames per second. That doesn't quite match cameras like the Sony A1 that do 50 megapixels at 30 frames per second. You could do 30 frames per second, but you have to drop to JPEG. And for me, I just don't shoot wildlife in JPEG because you so frequently need to recover the highlights or recover the shadows because birds are often black and white and there's lots of reflections. So that means if I want to shoot Nikon, I have to give up a significant number of frames per second, 10 frames per second. They're going to address that and fix it. And if they can do it with a firmware update, I can't figure out why they haven't done it in like the several years that the Nikon Z9 has been out because that's been one of our biggest concerns. But if they can do it, then that's great. And I, you know, I did the math on the sensor readout speeds and I think they should be able to. Now the question remains what the buffering is going to be, how long you'll be able to shoot, but when it's available, we will publish a review as soon as humanly possible. I promise you. There's also an interesting rumor about what they call a C60 FX burst shooting, which is 60 frames per second. And today's Z9 and Z8 will do 60 frames per second with 19 megapixel JPEG, so scaled down JPEGs. This is going to be a new option where every third frame is 45 megapixels followed by two 11 megapixel frames. Imagine you're shooting sports in this mode. You're essentially getting full 45 megapixel files at 20 frames per second. And then you're getting a separate set of 11 megapixel files at 40 frames per Per second. If there's a moment where the action isn't super fast, you'll be able to pull that 45 megapixel high quality file. If there's another moment where somebody is headbutting a ball and everything is happening extremely quickly and the action takes precedent over the amount of detail, you'll be able to pull one of those 
more frequently captured 11 megapixel files. I'm excited for two reasons. One, nobody has ever done this before. So thank you for thinking outside the box, Nikon. But also, I do think this provides a really good compromise for sports shooters especially. There's also going to be something that seems directly stolen from the A9 Mark III, which, if I'm interpreting it right, is the JPEG continuous shooting speed switching. Today, the Z8 and Z9 shoot 30 frames per second at 45 megapixel JPEGs, or you can go to 120 frames per second if you drop down to 11 megapixels. You choose one or the other by sort of pressing the shutter mode button and scrolling to select a different frame rate. My interpretation of this is that with the new firmware update, you'll be able to press a custom button and switch instantly from 30 frames per second to 120 frames per second, perhaps as long as you have the button held down. That's exactly what the A9 does. It is simply a user interface thing. It should be extremely easy to program. So I can definitely see Nikon adding that. On my borrowed A9 Mark III, I have reprogrammed the default button and... God, I've been shooting with the A9 Mark III and the default custom button is kind of on the front by the grip and that hasn't worked out well for me. It's difficult to reach. I've reprogrammed that to the AF on button because I no longer really need to use the AF on button because autofocus is so reliable, but that's how I've been setting it up and that's how I'll set up my Z8, Z9 when that firmware update comes. They're also adding pre-capture for RAW files. Currently, they both offer pre-capture for JPEG files where you can set it up so that when you press the shutter button, it goes back half a second or a full second and saves all those files that are in the buffer to your memory card, essentially going back in time and allowing you to trigger the shutter and capture something that you had in focus. This allows you to only save files once you've confirmed that the heron caught the fish or the goalie blocked the shot. It also offsets the human reaction time of about a quarter of a second. We found it pretty useful, but we've always wanted it for raw files, so I'm glad we finally have it. They're also going to offer 8K at 120 frames per second, which is crazy, but they're only gonna do it for two and a half seconds. So you'll be able to get a short burst of action, not something anybody's gonna use every day, but it might be nice for those moments like a heron pulling a fish out of the water where the action happens over a short period of time and you want to slow it down and still capture as much detail as possible. They're also going to offer a new log curve for NRAW, which maybe will help you provide more dynamic range or provide better compatibility with other shots and don't have enough detail about that. And they're adding anamorphic support for a whole bunch of lenses, including doing a open gate 45 megapixel three by two video at 30 frames per second. I hope they offer that with non-anamorphic lenses, just standard lenses, because I think that's a super useful functionality for those of us who shoot video for both wide formats like this and vertical formats like TikTok. By over-capturing both vertically and horizontally, you have more option for cropping in post. I predict that not all of those features are going to be available for both the Z8 and Z9. I think the Z8 was so good, but so close to parity with the Z9 that they probably lost a bunch of potential Z9 buyers and I think Nikon is going to use these firmware updates to better differentiate the top-end Z9 from the mid-range Z8. With this predicted firmware, here's how the Z9 will compare to the A1. And here's the thing, it looks really good. They'll both shoot 30 frames per second raw at about 50 megapixels. And in the past, the A9 has had drastically better autofocus, but with the new firmware updates, that's no longer the case. They're close enough in autofocus quality that I would happily pick either one, and that's with the 4.1 firmware. The Z9 also offers higher frame rates at lower megapixels, the 60 frames per second thing that we talked about earlier, 60 frames per second at 19 megapixels, or that alternating 45, 11 megapixel mode, or 120 frames per second at 11 megapixels. The Z9 will do raw pre-capture. The A1 doesn't have anything like that, unfortunately. The Z9 already wins for video doing AK at 60 frames per second compared to AK at 30 frames per second, but that extra 120 frames per second for short bursts will be another advantage. Comparing the Z9 with the new firmware to the A9 Mark III, the global shutter camera that we are currently testing, the A9 Mark III has an advantage with zero millisecond readout speed, a true global shutter. However, the Z9 and the Z8 have a very fast stacked shutter that we don't have any problem with in sports and wildlife photography. It's fast enough that we don't see those 
rolling shutter artifacts that you sometimes get, you could certainly come up with examples like a drummer swinging the drumstick at really high speed where you'll see a slight curve or a golf swing where you see a slight curve. But overall, it's not a big deal, but that still is a distinct advantage for the A9 III. That's something no Nikon camera can do with their 3.7 millisecond readout speed. However, the A9 Mark III is only a 24 megapixel camera, while it does shoot 120 frames per second raw, and the Z9 only shoots 120 frames per second at 11 megapixel JPEGs. So the Z9 has the capability to do 45 megapixel raw at 30 frames per second. So over those times when you need lots of detail, lots of reach, things like wildlife photography, the Z9 has a massive advantage. They both offer raw pre-capture, but the Z9 will do AK at 60 frames per second or even 120 frames per second for short bursts, while the A9 Mark III is limited to 4K at 120 frames per second. The base ISO is also an important consideration. The Z9 and Z8 have a base ISO of 64, so you can get longer exposures in bright conditions or when shooting wide open. Without overexposing or without having to use an ND filter, the Z9 Mark III is more limited with its base ISO of 250. This sounds bad for Sony users, right? Nikon seems to be crushing it because Nikon has the economies of being in third place behind Canon and Sony. While Canon and Sony are sort of fighting for each other, but primarily competing against their own cannibalization, they are actively holding features back that they could offer because they don't want to offset any future sales. They don't want to give something away in a free firmware update that they might use in a future camera release to encourage you to buy a whole new camera, right? But Nikon being in third place, they're, they're scrappy. They're fighting for market share and thus they're willing to give stuff away in order to pull people into their system. I think it's those economies that are driving Nikon's generosity with their firmware. But Sony also announced a firmware update and this is not a rumor, I got this in a press release. For $150, you can add custom grid lines to your A7 IV coming in spring. I am happy about this. I know people are really infuriated by it because $150 is a lot of money for something you could do with a piece of tape on the screen, which is what I've always done in the past. Or it sounds so simple, why not make that a free firmware update? But I think this is better than requiring you to buy a whole new camera. And it's $150 because it's probably a custom feature requested by a small handful of professional users, people like professional, like school photographers who actually need it. And thus they hired a programmer to do the work and they're offsetting the cost of that programmer by charging these small number of people who actually need it. They're not passing the cost on to everybody. Could this be a free firmware update? It, it certainly could. I think everybody would appreciate it if it was. But more and more camera manufacturers are going to be in the software business and not the hardware business. They have leveled out on what they can do with image quality, autofocus speed, all the hardware stuff, and they need to find a way to make money by improving the software. And more and more of my requests nowadays are for better and better software. So I do want to see camera manufacturers find a way to make selling software profitable so that we can fix the glaring software problems that we have in our existing cameras. And this is probably the tip of the iceberg. I suspect in the future, you'll be able to piecemeal together a bunch of features and get the least expensive possible camera that has all the things you want. And I know that's not what everybody loves. We all love free stuff, right? But companies have to make a profit. That is their nature. Tanstaffel, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. That applies to firmware updates and your presence on the web. It doesn't cost anything to put something up on Facebook or Instagram, except, well, it, it does, right? Because there is no such thing as a free lunch because they're going to own your page. They're going to have some rights to your images. They're going to be injecting ads, even ads for your competitors on your own page. I suggest taking control of that. Is it completely free? Well, no, the trial is free at squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out completely free. But after that, you'll have to pay. But that's a good thing because again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If you want your own custom domain, if you want to get emails at northropphotography.com instead of gmail.com, if you want a store where you can accept orders from clients, if you want to be able to have a private space for images distributed to your clients, if you want to look your best, you go to squarespace.com slash Tony and try it out. And then I think you'll see the benefits of it. You'll see how fantastic your photos and videos look. And you'll want to use my coupon code Tony to get 10% off. So check that out. And I think you'll appreciate that some things are worth paying a little bit for. 
Thank you, Squarespace, and uh, in the comments down below, let me know if you're excited about Nikon's firmware update, if you're pissed about Sony's firmware update, or what else is on your mind. Bye.